Welcome everyone to Engaging Descendant Communities with, farming, with the Slave Dwelling Project, Farmington Historic Plantation, Historic Locust Grove, the Oxmoor Farm Foundation, um, and Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing. My name is Hannah Zimmerman and I am the Marketing and Communications Director at Historic Locust Grove here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Locust Grove is a historic site in Louisville that dates back to 1792 and over um, between 1792 and 1856, over 70 individuals, men, women, and children were enslaved at Locust Grove um, during the time of William and Lucy Cron. Um, so we had the pleasure of hosting uh, Joe McGill last August um, at Historic Locust Grove for one of his wonderful conversations for his overnight program, which is thought provoking and we have not stopped talking about it since. So we're very pleased that we're able to um, welcome him back in this place today, this virtual space. Um, I see we're having a couple more people join us just now. So I'm going to um, pause in my introduction for a minute for a few technical announcements as you are joining us. As you are joining us, we're going to ask you to keep your videos turned off. Um, I see Joe waving to some friends. Um, it, please do not take it personally if I turn off your videos. It's wonderful to know that you are on the other side of the screen, um, but we do want to keep the focus on our five panelists this evening. Um, we're also gonna ask you to keep your microphone turned off. And in the chat, we have a robust conversation going about where we are watching <clears throat> from. So please do let us know where you are watching from. Um, and this evening, we um, are making a recording of this program, um, but you will ask questions of our panelists in the chat. So if you have a question for one or all of our panelists, Cassandra, Bridget, Victoria, Teresa, and Joe, you can leave those in the chat and I will make sure that those get answered for you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just briefly introduce our, just going to briefly introduce our um, historic sites if you will indulge me for just a moment. Um, we'll start off with Farmington Historic Plantation. Louisville's first historic house museum um, was Farmington Historic Plantation and it interprets a 19th century Kentucky hemp operation. Originally 550 acres, Farmington was home to the John and Lucy Speed family and approximately 70 enslaved people at the height of its operation. Abraham Lincoln visited his close friend, uh, Speed Sum Joshua, for three weeks here in 1841, the only time the future president fully participated in the lifestyle of a Southern planter. Um, the descendants of um, David and Martha Spencer, who were enslaved at Farmington by Speed's son-in-law, Austin Pay, have shared information critical to Farmington's interpretation and are engaged in many of the site's ongoing activities. Spencer descendant Benjamin C, who's joined this evening, Cassandra C, Benjamin's mother, is with us here. Um, so Benjamin C honored his ancestors by planting Farmington's 2019 hemp crop. And recently, individuals descended from Abram and Rosanna Hayes, another couple owned by Pay, scheduled a 2020 family reunion at Farmington, which has been rescheduled for hopefully June of 2021 due to the ongoing pandemic. Um, so we're very pleased to have with us this evening, Cassandra C from Farmington Historic Plantation. Um, Cassandra Swansea has been interested in her family history since she was a child. After researching her own Swan family history, which can be traced back to the late 1600s and to Southern cotton plantations, she turned her attention to her husband's ancestors. Excuse me just a minute. I'm just gonna let a couple more people in. This is <clears throat> Um, Cassandra turned her attention to her husband's ancestors. Her husband's great grandparents were David and Martha Spencer, who were enslaved on John's Beads Hemp Plantation, Farmington. Cassandra feels the fibers that bound both ancestral communities came together in the family she created with Glenn C. And Cassandra is a valued Farmington contributor and volunteer. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you so much. Hello. For How are you doing tonight? We're you glad you're here. All right. Um, Next up, we have uh, Ox Oxmoor Farm Foundation. Oxmoor Farm is one of Jefferson County's oldest continually operating agricultural enterprises. Alexander Scott Bullitt purchased the 1,000 acre property in 1787 and brought his family and enslaved workers to Oxmoor. By 1816, Bullitt's labor force consisted of 101 enslaved individuals and was one of the largest holdings in Jefferson County. The enslaved labored on the farm until the end of the Civil War in 1865, while the Bullitt family lived at Oxmoor until 2005. 
Bullet family letters document births, weddings, and deaths of many of the people they enslaved. These letters also document familial connections with nearby Farmington Plantation in both racial groups. Mildred Bullitt's sister, Lucy Speed, lived at Farmington. Her husband owned Phyllis and Morocco, whose sister, Jenny, lived at Oxmoor. Today, the historic portion of Oxmoor Farm is protected by a 79-acre preservation easement with the Kentucky Heritage Council and will begin holding public events and educational programming in 2021. Oxmoor is a rare historic site with original slave dwellings still standing, as well as other farm outbuildings. Restoration of the slave dwellings will also begin in 2021 and include an exhibit giving the public the chance to encounter history where it took place and will not only focus on slavery at Oxmoor, but also tell the broader history of slavery in our state and nation. And representing Oxmoor this evening, we have with us today Bridget Johnson, who is the three-time great grand three-time granddaughter of Louisiana Taylor, also known as Mammy Touche, who is an enslaved woman at Oxmoor Farm. Of her children, she had Eliza Julia, who bore Eliza, who gave birth to Bridget's grandmother, Naomi Julia. Bridget's mother was one of two. She had a twin brother named Ernest. Um, Bridget is a native of Evansville, Indiana. Her father was born in Kansas and she grew up in Kansas. Some years and a few states later, she settled in the Washington DC area, which she considers home. In 2000, she relocated to Indianapolis to assist with caring for her mother and who had had a stroke and began some family research, but never got too far until a few years ago <clears throat> when her niece inquired about the family history. Bridget began to research again, and this time with some success, as she found some cousins in Indiana, Russ Bolds and James Keyes Sr. And last year, a journalist named Dan Gediman, his podcast and radio show, The Reckoning, is airing now, was working on a piece about slavery in Kentucky. And Dan reached out to her, and through his research, he introduced us to her ancestor, Louisiana, and her connection to Oxmoor. Bridget is a mother of three, two girls and one boy, She's a paraprofessional and works with special needs children. Thanks so much for being with us this evening, Bridget. We're glad you're here. All right, and we uh, will continue on with Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing. Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing is a nearly 300 acre historic site located on the Ohio River in Southwest Louisville. The property was farmed from the 1820s well into the 20th century. An active riverboat landing connected this remote farm to the wider world for most of the 19th century. The restored house, now a museum, is named for the two property owners with the longest history on the site, the Farnsleys and the Mormons. From 1820 to 1865, as many as 23 enslaved men, women, and children lived and worked at Riverside. The leadership and staff at Riverside are dedicated to learning as much as possible about the individuals enslaved on the property in order to tell the complete story of our collective past and create a space for important conversations regarding how our history impacts the present. Since it opened to the public in 1993, Riverside has been open year round for tours, educational programs, and events. And joining us today uh, to represent Riverside, we have Teresa Lee, who is a graduate of Indiana University with a degree in history and minors in gender studies and anthropology. Her research is focused on historical trauma. Teresa has been affiliated with Riverside in various ways since 2010. She is currently historic site supervisor and is part of the ongoing efforts to maximize the impact that Riverside as a historic site can have on the public. Thank you for being with us, Teresa. Thank you for having me, Hannah. Um, and Victoria Trice um, is an educator at Central High School, the first school for African Americans constructed with public funds in the state of Kentucky in 1873. The first valedictorian from Central in 1884 was Emma Alexander, a woman born enslaved at Riverside. Emma's sister Carrie was also a teacher at Central, and Victoria is a former seasonal worker at Riverside, a graduate of Fisk University, and received her master's in education from Bellarmine University. She teaches African American history and developing Black historical consciousness at Central High School, and is also the liaison for Riverside's collaboration with Central. Thank you for being with us, Victoria. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, and Locust Grove, um, I'm representing Locust Grove this evening. Uh, we are currently working on finding our descendants, so which is why we're especially interested in tonight's topic. We have um, several wonderful researchers, one of, a, with, one of whom is with us this evening, Heather Heiner, um, who are helping us track down all of the different descendants of our enslaved community, about 70 men, women, and children enslaved at Locust Grove between 1792 and 1856. We've uncovered over 70 names and are running through the family trees um, to the present day to find 
who might be descended from our enslaved community. Um, and we have been fortunate enough to have Joe McGill of the Slave Dwelling Project um, join us last year to help with this process um, and to also help us in our um, development, research, and interpretation of a building on our site that in the spring will be our new enslaved dwelling exhibit that focuses on telling the story of one family at Locust Grove. So without further ado, Joe, are you ready to be introduced? Ready. All right. And then I will promise I will let it take, take it away with our wonderful panelists. Um, so Joe McGill is um, a history consultant for Magnolia Plantation in Charleston, South Carolina, and the founder of the Slave Dwelling Project. The Slave Dwelling Project envisions a future in which the hearts and minds of Americans acknowledge a more truthful, truthful and inclusive narrative of the history of the nation that honors the contributions of all our people, is embedded and preserved in the buildings and artifacts of people of African heritage, and inspires all Americans to acknowledge their ancestors. Part of the mission of the Slave Dwelling Project is to raise awareness and organize resources to preserve, interpret, maintain, and sustain extant slave dwellings and other structures significant to the stories of the enslaved ancestors. Support and encourage individuals and organizations to preserve and mark sites related to the institution of slavery and the legacy of slavery, and to engage people in honest conversations about slavery, race, racism, and racial equity in search of improved racial relations. As the founder of the Slave Dwelling Project, Sleeping in Enslaved Dwellings, this Joe McGill and this project has brought much needed attention to these often neglected structures that are vitally important to the American built environment. Prior to his current position, Mr. McGill was a field officer for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, working to revitalize the Sweet Auburn Commercial District in Atlanta, Georgia, and to develop a management plan for <coughs> Mississippi Delta National Heritage Area. Joe McGill also served as the executive director of the African American Museum located in Cedar Rapids, Rapids Iowa, and is the former director of history and culture at Penn Center, St. Helena Island, South Carolina. Mr. McGill was also employed by the National Park Service, serving as a park ranger at Fort Sumter National Monument in Charleston, South Carolina. Is the founder of Company I, 54th Massachusetts Reenactment Regiment in Charleston, South Carolina. The 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry was the regiment portrayed in the award-winning movie, Glory. Joe McGill is a native of Kings Tree, South Carolina. He's an Air Force veteran and also holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in professional English from South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Joe, thank you for being with us this evening. Take it away. <clears throat> wow, quite an introduction. Um, I wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to, to be here tonight. I also want to thank the 68 participants. I see that uh, in the chat, we have uh, 26 responses so far. So this, we're off to a, a, a beautiful start. So yes, I'm, I'm Joseph McGill with the Slave Dwelling Project. Uh, so 10 years ago, I, I got this, this crazy idea about spending nights in slave dwellings, uh, trying to you know scratch an itch, if you will. Um, these places that I would visit would um, talk about the enslavers, but uh, talk very little about those who were enslaved at these sites. Um, so this idea of, of sleeping in these places caught on quickly. So 10 years later, I'm, I'm still um, sleeping at these sites. Um, but what I've been more into lately, I've been working a lot with sites that are more uh, concerned now with working with the descendant uh, community. Uh, I'm lucky 10 years ago, I, I met uh, a genealogist, her, um, and, and she told me that, um, well, I expressed to her uh, what I was doing with this project. Um, and, and she started talking about the people uh, in the places. And of course, I'm, I'm a preservationist. I, con I concentrate on the place. And she told me to keep doing that. She said, you save the places and we'll put the people there. Her name is Tony Carrier. Um, and her saying that 10 years ago uh, made me realize that, yes, yeah, saving the places are important. We have to do that. We need to do that. But in saving the places, we also uh, give, uh, put a placeholder, if you will, uh, in that spot where our ancestors need to be discussed and should be discussed. Um, 
we are beyond that point where these sites only talk about those who enslaved. Uh, we are at a place now uh, where we are getting more comfortable with talking about um, uh, the enslaved ancestors. I've had the pleasure of uh, going to a few sites that I'll name here, uh, Monticello. Uh, they're doing a good job. Monticello, the home of, of Thomas Jefferson. Of course, that was somewhat forced because there was this denial phase of uh, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. There were those who were non-believers and the DNA proved otherwise. Um, so I've interacted with that site, the descendants of Sally Hemings and uh, got to hang out with them at uh, Monticello. I've uh, also gone to Montpelier, the, the home of uh, President James Madison and, and interacted with some, the de uh, some descendants of enslaved people there. Um, you know, sleeping in the recreated slave cabins uh, with some of those descendants. Uh, there's a place in North Carolina, Creswell, North Carolina, called Somerset, where uh, last year, 2019, I had the pleasure of participating in a family reunion there. Um, North Carolina has this policy, statewide policy, that if if it's a site where people were enslaved, the descendants of those can come to that site and uh, do programs, uh, uh, family reunion type programs, and they won't be charged uh, to use the facilities. So I had the pleasure of uh, hanging out at a family reunion uh, at, uh, in Somerset, North Carolina. I also um, uh, I went to a place, uh, McCollum Farm, uh, in McCollum Farm, in uh, North Carolina also and, and, and got to hang out with a, a family that was uh, doing a reunion there. So it's, it's great that this is uh, taking center stage in Louisville um, and it sounds collective from what I'm, from what I'm gathering here from the, from the guests, uh, the other panelists that are, that are on the screen here. So um, I guess I want to, I want to yield some time if, uh, if, if any of you want to describe where we are in the process of, of you as uh, African Americans uh, interacting with those sites where your ancestors were enslaved. Um, how does that, you know, how are we progressing with that? And, and, and what are the, you know, what are some of the challenges in, in making uh, some of this happen? Uh, and of course, Teresa Lee, you as a representative of one of these sites, of course, you, you come from a, you represent that angle of, uh, of the site. But I do want to, you know, hear from, from, from the panelists, you know, as, as African Americans, see where you are in, in your process of connecting your, uh, the current descendants to that uh, particular site. And as I look at my screen over here, uh, I got Cassandra uh, to the left. Um, so if you wanna, if you wanna take that question and give us an update on where you guys are in um, connecting the descendants to the particular site that uh, where they where the ancestors were enslaved. Um, here at Farmington, we've been working, I believe, since two thousand and three. Um, I I was married to a fellow, great guy by the name of Glenn C. And his he he, he is the descendant. A lot of people think I am, but it's my husband. And um, he passed away in uh, 2018. But we had started way long time ago. Um, I kind of just stumbled in here and they, they, uh, a lady that, who happens to be the director right now, Kathy uh, Nichols, uh, she was my biggest cheerleader the whole time. Even when she was out of the state, we still communicated. And um, a lot of what we were able to do was because of her help. And uh, through the years, she's continued to help us get the right information. Um, a lot of times when you're doing African-American history, uh, you can stumble upon stuff that you think is your history and then you get down the road and you find out it's the wrong family. And so that can happen, but it, it can happen. We, we can find our people. Um, and, and not only have I done it on my husband's side, connecting to Farmington, but my parents, um, both my, my father and my mother's families, and m me and my sisters actually talk almost every night about some nugget that we found 
um, in history. Uh, we just started using Ancestry.com because my sister did take the test and it has made it a little bit easier, but it can be done. Now, specifically Farmington, um, there is a lot of documented history that's already out there. Believe it or not, you can find a lot of clues in that documented history. Uh, you can also find pictures in, in, in the already established doc, documented um, family histories. Uh, the Speed family, they have a lot of um, information out there. Uh, and you can find hints, little nuggets uh, embedded in, the, in that already docu documented history. Farmington has done a, a fairly good job. Um, it, it, you know, like anything else that we do in this country, uh, if, if there's a trend and everybody's on board with that trend, you, you know, everybody's gung ho and, and you get a lot of support. If that dies, it dies too, that support dies. Uh, but there's always somebody around and that is Kathy Nichols. She's back at Farmington now after being away for a while. And, and we are starting again, um, getting that information together and getting that information out. And that's the biggest thing is there's a lot of people out there that um, they, some, let me say this, there's some people that want the information out and there's some people that don't want the information out. And so you have to switch, you have to sift through um, those people, you know? Um, but we, we are doing a fairly good job of uh, people finding us and us finding people. And, and that's what it takes. Um, you have to do it on purpose. It can't be mechanical because people know. Um, and, and at the same time, you, you have to uh, sift through our oil histories and get the truth of the oil histories. A lot of times what we found in all of our family histories that we've, that we've uncovered, um, you find a lot of stuff out there that's embellished. You find a lot of stuff out there that's trying to continue to hide the skeletons. But you got to be able to uh, look at everything, look at the total picture, and, and stay as uh, factual as you possibly can. And that's been our biggest thing ever since we started, was to, uh, at the same time, we want the, uh, the history, we want the facts. We don't really want you know, somebody made up, you know, if, if, a, if a person is a, is a mixed, mixed uh, uh, breed, if they are mixed, a mixed race, uh, we want to know whether they're Indian or white. We don't, we don't want the embellished, romanticized um, Af um, Native American tribes, and, and they weren't even in the area. In other words, you, you do get that. You get that, oh, we're Cherokee, or we're this, or we're that. And they weren't even in the area that you're doing the history on. And so uh, our family, we, we're, we're loaded with Choctaw Indians. Uh, everybody has said it's been this and it's been that. But on both sides of our family, my husband and myself, um, in Mississippi, they were Choctaw. In, in uh, here in Kentucky, there was some Choctaw in there. And so, you, you know, it's, it's just that type of thing. You want to get as much truth in your history as possible. We are responsible now, Black Americans, for our own history and the interpretation of that history. You can no longer think that somebody else is going to accurately represent your histories. I hope that wasn't too long. Sorry. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, Victoria, what's the relationship, uh, current relationship between uh, you and your effort and Riverside? Um, well, currently, um, I am the liaison between Riverside um, and Central High School, my current place of employment. Um, we're starting a program um, to allow some of my history students to come um, participate in archaeology and even help with the interpretation um, and for the research of the enslaved people on site. Um, Central High School is still a predominantly African-American high school. Um, we were founded um, basically right after the Civil War, a few years after that, um, to educate former enslaved uh, people. So there's tons of ties 
um, I guess I would say, between Riverside. I know we talked a little bit earlier about that tie with the first valedictorian of Central uh, being also a Central teacher um, eventually. So um, that's kind of my current tie. Um, in the past, I was a seasonal docent. Um, I've not been able to participate because of, um, because of COVID, but um, in the past, I was a seasonal docent. So uh, some uh, research, those type of things, just kind of looking through some of the records and educating myself. Um, I think with my background history wise, um, I really, to be perfectly honest with you, avoided anything um, in, during the antebellum period or anything directly after it um, in my studies uh, in college. And then of course in grad school as well, I've avoided it, I've gone beforehand. I was like, let's go ahead and study a little ancient history to where I don't have to deal with this pain. Um, and so getting the job at Riverside to me has been um, a blessing in a sense um, because it's forced me to really um, kind of unpack some of the pain that I think a lot of African Americans feel in reference to being a formerly descendants of a formerly ens enslaved. It's forced me to address some of the shame um, that a lot of us feel um, unnecessarily, of course, but the shame that's kind of passed down about, you know, we don't talk about that because we used to be um, enslaved or um, even some of the haughtiness of I am not my ancestors um, type of uh, type of word. So um, it's forced me and then also it's, it's made me, I would say a better teacher in a sense because I'm able to help some of my high school students unpack some of that. This idea that we're, you know, they want to know about um, slavery. They want to understand what happened. They want to understand how this ties to now. Um, they have these questions, but um, so many teachers don't have the language to say it. They don't have the knowledge to say it. And they're, they're really, again, even whether they're white teachers or black teachers or what have you, they still, it's this taboo topic of talking about, it. okay, there was slavery, but let's get to the Civil War, you know, and we kind of skip through. So I would say that's kind of my connection with Riverside now. It's just, it's been a blessing to help me unpack some of that shame and those, those emotions and help some of my students as well. Oh, beautiful, great. Uh, so, uh, Brigitte, um, what a, what's the relationship, current relationship between you and your efforts at Oxmoor? Um, well, since uh, meeting Shirley for the first time last year through Dan, finding my great great grandmother, which oh, was a blessing. I just that was a big chunk of our history that none of us ever knew that we would be able to um, get this far. Um, my brother. I just spoke with him a few months ago and I was telling him about this. I hadn't spoken to him in a while and he was like, what, what do you mean you found our great, great, great grandmother? And I said, yeah, I found her. Well, someone else found her and then they found me through the ancestry. I had hit a brick wall in my research because um, most of us already know that it gets very expensive. Um, getting documents and birth certificates and death certificates and not having the, uh, like Cassandra said, the true facts throws you off. You, you know, we just, we realized in my own family that my maternal side renamed their children after someone before, you know, and we were thinking this was the same person when in actuality, it was two or three different people. They were just named after each other. My grandmother alone is named after Louisiana's first daughter. So my grandmother's named Naomi Julia, but Louisiana, Louisa's daughter was named Eliza Julia. So they gave my grandmother her middle name, and then Eliza Julia gave birth to Eliza, her daughter Eliza. And so, we, so every time we found that name, and Kate, I said, well, now nah, this is the same person. No, this, well, who is this person? And come to realize it's three different people with the same name. And I was like, okay, so they, so they just renamed each other after an aunt or a grandmother or something like that. So it just, it was just mind boggling. And I'm glad that I met Shirley and Dan and everything. So Shirley has asked me to share photos of my, my, uh, my mother and my aunts and things like that, that they don't have at Oxmoor. Um, so to, to find that picture of Louisa was, is like, wow. You know, I have, 
women that I know in my family that look like her. And I'm like, now this is where it originated from. So I'm, I'm very excited at going forward with this because when I started this, this was just a personal thing. Uh, my great niece, she said, you know, auntie, I don't know anybody in our family. And I said, well, I really don't know either. I'm very young um, com compared to my siblings who were older and knew a lot of the elders in our family. So I said, I really don't know a lot of people, but I'm go I want to know. So I'm going to start searching. I had started dibbling and dabbing a few years ago. And then, like I said, in my bio, I started it up again and I found my cousin Russ and I found James, which is in Marion and one is here in Indianapolis and I actually got to go to a family reunion and meet cousins that I had been here for 20 years didn't even know I knew and then my cousin yeah you know they had been hanging out in the clubs or wherever they go you know and they knew each other but didn't know they were related um so I'm I'm really uh anxious to go forward to see how much more I can find out because I believe that my children need to know where I came from, where they came from, and so on and so forth. I, I just, um, I'm just happy that this family kept the documents that they kept on my family because like Dan said, most of uh, most of these places, everything was destroyed, no paperwork, no, no pictures or anything like that. So the fact that there is <laughs> there is document, there's letters that Mildred had written about my family, about my, about Eliza Julia getting married on the front porch. Like, who does that? You know, they were, we were even shocked. And me and Shirley just talked about it the other day that William Bullitt wrote my grandmother in his will. He, you know, he, he left her a certain amount of money to be paid to her every year to her dying death and then it was another gentleman so it's it's just opened up a big door of information and like we're we're trying to find out where louisa came from you know because there's there's, there's um writing and letters saying that her father was indian you know and then um it was a niece writing to thomas and he said yeah you got she said you have that wrong mammy's mammy's father was not white then you mother wrote about her grand, her father being Indian and stuff. So I'm in the process of trying to find where she came from, from Virginia. And I'm like, dang, I was in DC for years and never knew that I originated from here. So it's, it's just, I'm still in awe. I, I, I'm, I'm still in awe. Um, I, I listened to the first episode of The Reckoning and it just brought me back to that day when I met Shirley and I walked on Oxmoor's farm. And I just, I couldn't believe it. I, there's video footage that I want to see of me, but I, I felt that energy when I walked on those grounds. I envisioned Frank, the, the blind boy carrying up water from the spring house to the big house. And, and when I touched that, that, set, that slave dwelling, when I, when I touched the door, I couldn't go in. It was such an energy that came through me that I felt like I literally felt like I was walking in my own home because it was so close to the, to the main house. I just felt like this could have been Louisa's house by her being Mildred's personal servant for as long as she had been. I said, I know this has to be her home. She would have to be close to her mistress at any back and at two o'clock in the morning. This woman had 10 children and my great, great grandmother was the one that nursed her children. So there's no way that this, that my grandmother was way down the road and that woman needed her at two o'clock in the morning. She's right there. She's just, you know, a couple yards away and stuff. So it's, you know, for me, this is a person, but now that I have met Dan, I've talked to other people, I met descendants from the bullets, you know, uh, we have bonded and we want to go forward. We want to bring um, awareness and 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 we want to open up the discussion. Like Cassandra said, there's people that don't want to talk about this. They want to forget. Oh, it's it's it happened centuries ago. It has nothing to do with us, but it does. When you look at the country and the state of mind that this country is in now, it does. It has a reflect. It has a domino effect on us in 2020. 
and it needs to be in the the blinds need to come off and they just need to recognize there was yeah this happened we're not going nowhere and once you once you lift that up off your shoulder it happened we acknowledge it we ain't saying you got to like it but it happened and you're not going to you're not going to keep people like us and the people that's on on this watching this right now you're not going to keep us quiet about it that air that's over that that is over and it's time for us and the generations behind us to learn where they came from because there's no way they can go forward if they don't know where they came from oh, Berkey, where have you where have you been all my life um <laughs> yeah I, it sounds like we've got a we've got a lot in common um but i want to talk to teresa uh, because she comes from a you know from a from another angle okay. uh, one of one of one of the reasons well there's several that we aren't as far along um, in connecting descendants community descendant communities with the places where they their ancestors were enslaved is because the sites themselves mm -hmm. they don't want to go there for various reasons um, you know some legit some not um, so, so Teresa, uh, Riverside and, and, and Farnsley, what, uh, where are we in this uh, process? <clears throat> we are, um, I don't know, um, I think I speak for all four of the sites when I say we would love to be farther along than we already are. Um, and you're right, there are various reasons. Um, sometimes, you know, all, all four of our sites are, are completely different in a way, in the way um, they're structured, in a way they're funded. Um, but personally, we have not only um, just in the past month um, come up with the evidence, um, the connection, the, the direct connection to Central High School, um, but we have also, um, for the longest time, out of the 23 people enslaved at Riverside between 1860 and 1865, um, we only knew two names. And, um, and we had done research into, into these people, Richard and Kitty Thomas, and that actually led to the discovery of the connection to Central. Um, but we are, we are really excited um, to, to create a permanent um, associate, well, a permanent program with the school where the students get to um, not only help with the interpretation, um, but we are going to fund a permanent paid scholar, um, paid internship for a um, current or former central student because that's that's part of that is, is giving people access um, and, and and paid internships are few and far between um, but i think um, as a city louisville is really doing a good job i'm thankful for locust grove i think um, they have the capacity to really lead the way in a lot of ways. I'm thankful for Farmington, um, the connection that they have made and, and, um, and Oxmore. I, I think it's just really fascinating because all of these places, um, like I said, are, are, are different, are structured differently. You know, they do have different boards, they have different demographics, they have different histories. Um, and and I think we're we've all come to the same conclusion. This is not something, um, this is something we should do, but this is also something we want to do. This is what what really um, what keeps us passionate about the field is is finding those stories and learning about all the people that were involved in, in our sites and and making those connections. As a historian, for me, I love I love the way people are connected and finding out about that and sharing that. Um, and I truly believe that historic sites like ours have, have a huge responsibility. Um, we are a trusted source of information to assert we have a lot of influence into the narrative, um, the public narrative, and um, we, we also have a, a lot of opportunity because people are coming to us and they're seeking answers and we can, and we can give them real answers. Um, and, and being accurate in that is, is absolutely an obligation. So. Great, great. So, um, and anybody can chime in on any of the panelists. Um, so there is, there's genealogy, then there's DNA. So how do we handle it when, when we, when we get this genealogical information that place us on a particular plantation, 
but then the DNA uh, sometimes proved that not only were we owned by them, they're in our DNA. So how do we, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that? And anybody can chime in on that. Hold on, Cassandra, you're unmuted. Um, I need you to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there you go. I'm so sorry. We, that just came rolling out of me. <laughs> um, we deal with it like we do anything else that we uh, find that's unexpected or maybe sometimes expected. Um, the reality is it happened. The reality is DNA doesn't lie. And that's the good thing. I was not a fan of Ancestry.com or any of those other uh, sites where you give your DNA. I, that, that wasn't my, it took me a long time to even use Ancestry.com because I was very suspicious. But when I saw uh, some of the facts, now I can't speak for how it's going now. I don't really know about that now, but um, when I saw things line up in my own family and our DNA and where it was going and where it came from, um, I got a little bit more relaxed in my criticism of it. Um, and everybody's not that happy with that information. You'll get a lot of people making excuses for that information. But again, the thing is, what do the facts say? Even when you get DNA results, it still can be a little confusing. That's why you have to do your research, your research. You, have, you cannot go on what any one source says. Somebody mentioned earlier about finding people with names that are the same. That ha happens all, all the time because that's the way uh, our forefathers did in Africa. They named their children after the grandmother, in, in many cases, their grandmother, uh, paternal grandmother and uh, maternal grandmother. And so names are repeated. Um, and now I'm getting off. I'm sorry. I'm getting back to the DNA. The DNA does not lie. You're going to find some things that you don't expect again, and you're going to find things that you do expect. The best way to handle that is just handle it and move on. If you get stuck on, I don't want so-and-so in my DNA. I don't, I, that's not true. My, my, uh, one of my uncles used to say, that ain't my, that ain't my great, great, great granny, daddy on that picture. We, we, we got a, we got a, a picture of the, of our great, great, great grandfather. And my sister blew it up to a size 22 by 17, something real crazy. It's real, real big. And, and we gave all of our uncles one of them. He said he was going to pitch it out the window on the way down the road back to uh, Ohio. Well, come to find out that was him. And, and it's in his house. And, you know, it's, it's, he still got it. He's since passed away, but, but they still have the picture because that was him. That's what he looked like. Come to find out, my son had to take, took a picture standing right beside him, um, and he looks exactly like my son. At that particular time, and Benjamin wouldn't have changed his looks to look like that man, <laughs> but when he's standing beside that picture, he looks exactly like him, and nobody could deny that. When they saw that picture, they said, how on earth is this young man in, in, in 2000 looking like this man <laughs> that was born in the 1800s? Um, but again, you know, you can, you can fuss about it. You can get upset about it if you want to, but you're not going to get anywhere doing that. You got to look at what the DNA says. Beautiful, beautiful. Any, um, um, Victoria, you want to chime in on the DNA? Uh, sure. So although I don't have a direct connection to Riverside as far as DNA is concerned, and I'm not exactly sure which plantation my ancestors um, were enslaved upon. Um, I have done both 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Um, and like, much like Cassandra said, it varies. Um, and so 23andMe might say this specific percentage is, uh, for instance, I was kind of shocked at a certain percentage being like um, East Asian. It was like around Pakistan or um, I think in Sri Lanka. But then the next, uh, you know, Ancestry said, no, that's not it. That's actually uh, Filipino. So, I mean, 
it, it kind of varies, number one. Um, I guess the biggest shock that I had, because it was cool being able to see the percentage of African that I had that I could trace back to being majority Nigerian and um, the other half was mostly Benin and Togo. And, you know, being able to see those um, those countries and say, okay, yes, this is where my ancestors came from. It wasn't just like Sub-Saharan Africa, which, you know, was pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> but I guess, <laughs> I guess the biggest biggest shock for me um, was actually the percentage of European. Um, mm -hmm. to, to be African-American, to have both my parents as African-American, their parents, the parents before them, um, and then that generation before that as all being African-American, as all claiming to be African-American, and I take my DNA test and it's almost a quarter European, you know, it's, it's kind of shocking because you think, okay, is this, is this going to change the way that I see myself as far as my blackness is concerned? Um, you know, and then you also think, for me, I saw, I was like, that's just so crazy. I didn't think, you wouldn't think you'd be that much percentage when it's not, I'm not biracial, my parents aren't biracial, so on and so forth. Um, but then also, I know the history of it, and I think to myself, that 20% was not some, most likely some lovely couple that just decided to have babies and like be happy and frolic. This is most likely, you know, the product of the raping of black women on, you know, plantation and slave sites. Um, and so for me having to think about that and realize, I mean, this is here in black and white, um, you know, the results of, you know, those rapes. I am a result, I'm a product of that. Um, and having to really think about that um, really puts a lot of things into perspective. It puts a lot of history into to modern day, because much like Cassandra said, DNA doesn't lie. I mean, you know, even though the percentages might be a little different for 23andMe versus Ancestry, it's still a whole lot more than I really thought it was going to be. Um, and so one interesting thing that um, Ancestry did give me um, is that that percentage of african-american or that they that they perceived they said it was actually from virginia um and so that some of my ancestors were some of the first to come on slave ships to this country um and were in virginia so now i have a little bit more of direction to go to because just like um Reed said and cassandra said you get to a certain point and you kind of you know you kind of have to stop because it's not i'm not able to get too much further i know that you know, my grandparents came from Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. I know that a lot of those ties down there, um, I know my, you know, my dad's side, they're from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, and we can tie a little bit of the plantation here that, you know, Todd's is French, uh, French Canada and things like that, but it's, at a certain point, it stops. So I think with those DNA sources, um, I think it does help a little bit because you can kind of, maybe you don't have the full in-between, but it gives me more of, the beginning points and now I've got the end points and now it's just a matter of trying to connect those dots and see exactly where my ties are. So I think it's just kind of a, you know, I guess an ongoing process of trying to find out where exactly you're from. But again, I was, I was very pleased with doing both and, you know, finding that information. And, you know, like I said, now I've got some places to go on my bucket list. Um, <laughs> Great. Good job. So, Fergie, Good job. Before, you, before, you, before you chime in, let me remind the, uh, the audience that, that we're, we're going from genealogy and now we're dealing with the DNA. The DNA as, as what we know relates to the site where our ancestors were enslaved. In other words, yeah, the de genealogy puts us there, but what, what do we do when the DNA puts us there also connects us to the enslaver? So, um, Fergie? For, for yeah, um, I did my DNA through Ancestry also, and I was not shocked when I got back the results. Um, just from what I know from my maternal side and my paternal side, my great, my grandfather, um, his mother and where she came from, you know, the French Quarter down in Louisiana. Um, so when we read things about Louisiana uh, talking about her father was na was was a native Indian, and then on the back of her picture that we that someone turned into the Filson uh, with her holding um, Helen Stythe at five months old. On the back of that photo, it for some reason it was in parentheses that her father was native Indian. I was like, why would they put that on the back of her picture? So when I did my DNA. It went back to Virginia. That's where it's, I mean, it was 
Europe. It was Europe, Africa. It was a lot of places overseas that I was like, really? Sweden? <laughs> I never thought about Sweden. Yeah. Never thought about the Netherlands. Never thought <laughs> about <laughs> German. There was Germany in there too. And I'm like, whoa, you know? <laughs> so, but I, 20, 28%, 28% European, 26% African, and then there's the other little stuff, you know, there's Irish and I'm like, okay, well, this is where the red hair and the freckles and all that comes from and <laughs> so on and so forth, you know. But then I started also dipping and dabbing on my dad's side. So just like Victoria said, you know, she knows her people came from Virginia and, you know, and my grandfather came from Hopkinsville also. So we could be related. <laughs> my, my, grandfa my grandfather's last name is Pierre, P-E-A-Y. Okay, I'm gonna have to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, P A E A Y is is our name. Um, there's even a uh, I think there's a college in Tennessee mm -hmm. that's from P A. So that could be you know. And then I found that there is humongous P A S in Louisiana. There was there's like a, a, a acapella males group, and they're all brothers and cousins of, and their last name is P A. I seen them on a show. I was like, those are my cousins because that's just a very <laughs> odd name. But like she said, it puts me like, okay, this is where I start because I know that Louisiana's mother, excuse me, Mr. Fry, Mildred's father, moved from Virginia, moved to Kentucky. And then when Mildred got married at 21, that's when she moved to Oxmoor with William and brought Louisiana at the age of 14. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but my great-great-grandmother was given to Mildred as a five-day-old infant on her seventh birthday. Mm. Mm. Mildred mm. was turning mm. seven. Mildred was turning seven years old. And my great-great-grandmother had just been born five days before that. And he gave her, I'm assuming, a live baby doll to play with. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, at the I age of 14, and at the age of 14, she moved with her mistress to Oxmoor, and that's where she lived the rest of her life. And they was like, well, that was before the Civil War. And I said, okay, all that 1865 Emancipation Proclamation, all the slaves set free. I said, but my great-great-grandmother was 60 years old. Mm. What was she going to do? Mm. Go, work, go work for another family that's probably mm. going to treat her horribly because if you read the stories that are written old. about my great great grandmother they they didn't talk about their daughter their slave daughters being married on the master's porch paying fifteen hundred dollars for eliza's for eliza julia's husband so they could keep them together mm. they didn't do that so they talked a lot about my my family and this is why dan reached out to me because he was like i've never I've never uncovered this much documentation. And this is one of the reasons why I reached out to you. But my DNA, it wasn't surprising to find out the other European. Um, my, if you can see my skin, I'm very fair. My mother is very fair. My great, great, my great grandmother, she's very fair, was very short, smoked a pipe and, 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 and walked with a cane. <laughs> Yeah, the DNA, DNA matches. matches. So, like you said, it doesn't lie. Yeah. It is what it is. I, I've had people okay. come to me and say, "Why are you, you know, why are you want to do in my own family? I don't want to do none of that. I don't care. It's over with. It ain't got nothing to do with me anymore." And I was like, "Fine, I'll just leave you. I'll leave you there. You, you can go ahead." But my family and my kids and my, I have people that want to know, you know, about where they came from, and I think that's one of the hardest things that black people have to face in this country because to me, and this is my personal opinion, that we are probably one of the only races in this world that cannot trace, that if you came here in America, cannot trace where we, cannot trace back where we came from with ease. With ease, that's right. With, with ease, ease. Yeah. With, ease. with ease, we can't do it that's because right. what was done, what was done to those On slaves purpose. when they brought over here? You got your, your culture was erased your true tribal name was erased. Everything about where you can, the land that you came from was purposely taken from us. We were kept, they were kept uneducated for a reason. It was a whole psychological purpose for doing all of that. Now, my last name shouldn't be Johnson. 
You know, I had until my, I could be honest with you, until my DNA test came back, I didn't consider myself to be African. Not because I was ashamed, because I didn't know how I'm going to call myself <laughs> something that I don't know that's where I came from. Right. But now that I know, I'm proud. Congo, mm -hmm. Ivory, and but and then my father's side, it's, it's even deeper because my father's side, I have traced it back to, to the Ibu tribe. Mm. Because somebody, an African looked at me, he said, are you from, your family's from the Ibu, from Nigeria? And I said, I don't know, you tell me. Mm. <laughs> and he and was like, what do you, you mean? And he said, well, you look like it, look it up. And shown up, when you look up Nigeria, Ibu is a city in there. And then I'm like, then I heard a few, like a few years ago, they considered the Ibu the lost tribe of Israel. Mm. Because they circled, when they when Moses freed them, they came back into Africa and that's where they settled. They were one of the first groups of Africans that got sold into slavery because the people, the natives didn't like them. So they helped them, enslaved them and sent them off. They came in on the coast, the Gulf Coast and stuff like that, just like they came in, like you said, Victoria, from Virginia. So I got descendants coming from hitting, hitting America, the first ones. I'm like, wow. But... It's so expensive. How are we gonna how are we gonna leave off this coast and go to the next coast and find out where he mm -hmm. came from? Is that 23 and me? I'm glad you spoke on that, Victoria. So I, I'm I'm gonna look into that too because I wanna know you can find I wanna it. know more. I wanna know more. Great. I wanna, I wanna know more. Great. So can I ask Bridget a question? Yes, real quick. She said something very important. Did I hear you say that you had P E A Y in your family? Yes, ma'am. That's my mother's mate. That's my mother's maiden name. Her, my my grandfather is James June James P. A. Senior. It's P. Everybody says it different, but it's it's pronounced P. Well, that is the 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 family that held my husband's ancestors was Peachy and Austin P. I bet it's the same family. It probably yeah, is. Well, they don't claim each other. Those guys don't claim each other. But if you do enough history, you'll find mm. the connection in them. They yeah. don't. They don't claim each other though. But my, that's where they were born. Austin P. I believe his parents lived on that plantation. I, if I'm correct, Oxmoor, correct no. or Bullet? Which one? Austin came here with his mother. Right. Bullet lived at Oxmoor. Okay, well, who lived in that little cabin we saw when we were out there? The Bullocks. The Bullocks. Austin B. purchased Farmington from Lucy. Right, right, right. But I thought his parents lived his on one mother, of them. No, 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 no. Okay. You're I'm, confusing Okay, I'm confusing siblings, she said. But that name, that yeah. name, the same name as uh -huh. Austin, the uh -huh. white, the husband mm -hmm. of Peachy, after John Speed died. Now, I'm telling you this because... Just yeah, like I know who P I know who you're talking about, Peachy. That's Thomas's sister. That's yes, Thomas Bullet's yes. sister, Peachy. Yeah. No, not Thomas Bullet's sister. Thomas no, Speed. No, they're both named Peachy. Oh, there's another one. Peachy, there's another one. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. It goes back to that name being repeated. Yeah. Which, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, the reason why I keep Kathy Nichols around me is because she makes me more active. It. That makes uh, me sound smart. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing um, wrong with that. But my whole point is, my whole point is that that name P E A Y mm -hmm. is a name that's connected to this plantation right here. Yeah. The reason why I know because that's who owned David and Martha Spencer. Yeah. That's that's what he's we're discovering. He's mentioned a lot in some of the slave narratives. Yeah, One of the hardest thing I ever did was study the slave narratives from Kentucky, and they yeah. they do collaborate each other's story. Yeah, because I think that's when Susan, when Mildred's daughter Susan married, she moved to Henderson, and that's where and Eliza Julia was her personal servant, and she went with Susan there, and then there's the Henderson. Uh, there's the Henderson uh, connection right there. Like my mother, my grandfather, like I said, was from Hopkinsville. My mother was born in Hopkinsville that, you know, and so on and so forth. And everybody migrated and so on and so forth. But yeah, uh, my great grandmother lies, my great grandmother Liza still lived. I have pictures of her sitting on the property in Henderson with the cabin, with the log cabin uh, in the background with my mother at age three 
being held up by Aunt Carolyn. These are the pictures I was going to give Shirley to put in, um, you know, to, to give her because they're all in black and whites and stuff. And um, because I think my grandmother well, make copies of your pictures and you oh, yeah. keep the original. Oh yeah, 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 most definitely, <laughs> right. most definitely. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Okay, we've got Hannah on screen. I think we've got questions to, uh, to we, answer. We do. We have several questions. So if you are an audience member and you have some questions for our panelists. Um, this conversation has been fascinating and wide ranging so far, and I do hate to interrupt this wonderful flow. Um, but uh, we do have a few questions. So let me go ahead. And um, one question we have from Dale Josie, um, he agrees um, to the idea of getting as much history of the enslaved as possible into the national conversation about this compelling topic. How do you um, address the majority of the population wanting to gloss over the evils of slavery as foundational to the antebellum South instead of romanticizing this important period of American history? How do you get over it? Um, how do you address the majority of the population oh. glossing over it or romanticizing it? How, how, when you're confronted with people who might want to sidestep um, the harsher realities. How how do you handle that? Uh, well, let me let me speak on that just a little. Um, I, I usually get that I usually get that uh, in the form of uh, the statement as you know, get over it, or <laughs> or, or, or it happened uh, a long time ago. That's you know that's that's ancient history or or, or something of that nature. Um, well, I, you know, I, I try to uh, make folks understand what it is. I mean, it is, you know, IT, that's a, that's a very, very simple word. I mean, but it is a lot when you, when you think about what they're asking us, us to do. I, of course, they ask, they're, they're asking us to fall in line with their way of thinking um, mm -hmm. in, in their narrative. Uh, that narrative that, that's, you know, that's been incomplete for so long, that narrative has, that has been false for so long. Um, that narrative that that glorifies the white males, um, and and I think we need you know we need to make them realize and recognize that that um, uh, you know even before colonization there were there were people here, and 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 even um, with colonization came you know the enslavement of people. Uh, we've got to give these people existence. We've got to give them agency. We've got to put them in these places and make these uh, uh, folks who want us to get over it realize that it's, it's, it's not their world alone. Mm. It's, you know, it, it, it's our world. Of course, I got my way of doing that. I call it, you know, I call it the slave dwelling project. And I'm sure, you know, you guys have your ways of doing it also. <laughs> yeah. um, does anyone, uh, sorry, before I move on to the next question, if you have other thoughts on that, please do share. No, I, I would like uh, to speak to that, you know, cause also, um, you know, as someone who, works with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, I think um, you have to, first of all, realize that sometimes it's just about planting a seed. Um, and, you know, I can remember as a student um, dealing with this topic, you know, especially with school children, and I would watch, I would watch, um, you know, I'd start talking about slavery with, with children of color and, and their heads would go down, you know, I could, I could see, I could see that shame and I was, you know, I, I saw in the chat, Carol talked earlier about that, um, you know, and it, it surprised me too. Um, but that's one of the reasons we've tried to move towards the word enslaved is, is to make this something that was done to somebody to, mm -hmm. to shift the language. And that even that, you know, visitors notice that and they ask about that. And, and I comment a lot about it's, it's to recognize this is something that was done to people. Mm -hmm. and, and you do get people who try and sidestep it or they try and gloss over it. And I know our site, for one, one of the ways we've done that is by not having a separate slavery tour, because mm. we always felt like if you had a separate tour, you could, visitors could opt out of, of hearing about that experience. Mm -hmm. And, mm. you know, the people, the people who lived that life weren't able to opt out of it. So um, it, it's part of the story of what happened. And I think there are multiple ways. And that's really, as professionals, we kind of have to address that. At, at every level and um, but it, it's, it's 
arming our docents mainly with information and giving them ways to respond is one of the best ways and and really helping them understand you know and and when somebody asks you know oh were they good slaveholders you know or good slave owners you know um, finding finding ways to get to the root of that because it really is about changing the narrative that there was such a good thing as a good slaveholder, you know, and 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 planting that seed so people people can know better and and gosh, hopefully do better. Um, but but it, it's a constant battle and it's one we as historic sites fall, fight on multiple fronts. So, and and can I ask a question to Teresa? Go sure. ahead. Um, in your bio, did it say that you had something to do with trauma? I study, um, my main field of study is historical trauma. And oh, so you have done the study on what slavery has done to this Absolutely. country. For, uh -huh. and, 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 the, and, the, and the effects that it, it causes on a genetic level. And it, Do and you it, put uh, that in your tour? Um, I absolutely do. And that's one of okay. the things I tell people is that this is, a, we start healing that trauma by acknowledging right. the wound. Right. And we can't, we can't, until you f talk about what it is, then we can't get over it. Right. right. Um, and, and, and that, and that really is, but the, our sites are places for those conversations. Right. That's right. really our responsibility, and that's that's how we as site at site stay relevant. That's that's the way um, we um, move forward into the future, and and it's I'm really excited that I think um, the community here in Louisville of historic sites is really dedicated to this, and and so many more conversations. This is just the beginning. So that's interesting. She said that like that. One of the things we talk about is you cannot confront what you. Don't, you cannot conquer what you don't confront. Oh, absolutely. And that is a true statement. A lot of people sidestep that too, yeah. but <laughs> that is a true statement. Well, and it's great. You know, I've had I've had conversations with Victoria. You know, one of the ways I can mobilize my privilege, you know, as a as a as a white person in America, is by kind of pushing those limits and 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 maybe saying some things that might make a visitor a little bit uncomfortable or make them question, you know, their assumption or, you know, it's, it is a way to, to push the limits and kind of, and hopefully expand people's boundaries. That's, that's what we're here for. At Locust Grove, we talk um, a lot about um, creating space for the conversations to happen and being okay with at first being uncomfortable because the only way you get comfortable with these with talking about it is by talking about it um and so we've done we've had a lot of difficult conversations which joe has helped us um facilitate over time um but we see our role as a historic site to be a place for these conversations to whether you're at the beginning of a conversation the middle or the which you're never at the end you know these are always ongoing um, so I think it's interesting, Teresa, that you said you don't offer enslaved-only perspective tours of Locust Grove because that's actually something we've been working on. We have a tour that works um, entirely if we could talk for hours about the crons of Locust Grove and the furniture and the wallpaper. And now we are trying to, we're writing a tour that is strictly from the perspective of an enslaved person that gives you the same sight in the same day in the life, but from a totally different point of view. And we find that centralizing, we've centralized the stories of this one family for so long that now it's time for us to centralize the stories of the other 70 people. That's right. Um, because we really do want to be able to respond and stay relevant as a historic site. Um, and to that end, we do, I do have a question um, about the role of historic sites that are linked to slavery, what role do they play um, now in our current social movement? Do you think it is linked to the history of slavery? And how are these sites, uh, what role do they have in speaking to these current events and in the future in terms of education and how we can reframe and change the narrative of slavery? So two questions there. Do you think the current social movement unfolding both locally in Louisville and nationally is linked to the history of slavery? What role do historic homes have in speaking to those current events and how can historic 
houses and sites um, continue to change the narrative in education moving forward? Well, I'm going to start off with that one just because I think, um, and interestingly enough, Hannah, with, with COVID and with the current events, we have such an increased interest that we are actually looking at a, a tour dedicated um, to telling those stories, um, really because there's such, a, there's such a hunger and we're getting, um, people are asking such nuanced questions and there is an increased um, desire for understanding. And so we're looking at um, making that accessible. But I think um, yes would be the overarching question. What is going on now is absolutely linked to the history of slavery. And, and I think it speaks to what I said before. We have to acknowledge that history. We have to acknowledge our collective history and the part that everybody played in it. And we have to talk about that. And, and, and historic sites are the place, um, one of the places where we can have those conversations. So, but other than that, I'm, I'm going to pass it along. So. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done. Um, but I want to stick to the answer of the question. So ask the question again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think current social movements locally and nationally are linked to the history of slavery? Yes. What role do historic houses have in responding to current social movements and how okay. can we do better and change the narrative in educating the public about the history of slavery moving forward? So big question. Tell the truth. Yeah. Tell the truth. Okay. Tell the truth. Tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Um, we Again, we've all talked about how um, surprisingly things are lost, things are burned in the fire, records are misplaced, um, things are just held secret, they're not told. Uh, you have to pay a whole lot of money or do a whole lot of stuff to get the truth. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can find in documented pictures and paperwork. Um, and and uh, it's connected because, again, if you continue to hide stuff from people, they're going to find it. They may not find it as readily as they possibly could, can, um, but that I've done things uh, to, to connect plantations and, and slaveholders. And on one hand, you get all the help you can. And on the other hand, they're, they're, they're going to tie your hands. They don't want, you know, a lot of people find it hard to um, just tell the truth. Just let the truth be known. Uh, if we could, if we could readily get our hands on information about the people that came before us, I don't know if we'd be burning stuff in the street. Now, I'm not going to get into that, but um, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you're going. And I would kind of yeah. chime in. On, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I would chime in on that as well because. I know from the perspective of a lot of my students who have been protesting peacefully, um, who have been protesting and hearing their reactions to how they now um, view our city, how they now um, view our police, Louisville Police Department now, how they uh, view police in general. Um, it's such a confusion um, to how we got to this point for my students. These are high schoolers, these are 15 to 18 year olds. And they're so confused, like, how did we get to this point? Like, Ms. Trice, I don't understand. Um, and so I think it's definitely tied, the social movement, it's definitely tied to, um, to slavery and definitely tied to um, these sites in, in a way, I guess in a sense. Um, we talk specifically about the Black Lives Matter movement. It's not a matter, and people get really personally sometimes when you say Black Lives Matter, it's not a movement to devalue anyone else's life. It's a value to, it's a movement to basically put emphasis on black lives and black bodies. Um, we've had a history in this country of devaluing black bodies right. when they weren't, the for our, weren't for the majority or weren't for people who had money um, when it wasn't for their financial gain. Um, when we were no longer financially um, you know, viable, when we were no longer money right. um, in a sense, that value that people that that people basically had in us as being money <laughs> and not necessarily the intrinsic value. I think that transition was really lost 
um, post-slavery, that transition of saying that yes, Black people do have intrinsic value, regardless of whether or not we're enslaved, regardless of whether or not we're money in your pocket, right? Um, and so I think these sites in general could really truth. We've got to be honest about what happened. Um, we can't just sugarcoat it and put on a hoop skirt and, you know, think everyone's Scarlett O'Hara. Like, this is just, that's not how it was, number one, <laughs> for anyone, for the most part. Um, but then also just being honest about what's happening and helping that transition for people to see um, some of these implicit biases, some of these, um, you know, prejudices that we all have, that we all need to work on, um, especially in this country. Um, I think we've done a poor job historically of addressing um, past transgressions. Um, and I hate, I'm not in the position to compare traumas or anything else with any other people or any other group, but when you look at Germany and you look at the way they addressed um, the transgressions that they had, the Holocaust, you know, all those people that were, that were killed and murdered, um, you know, there was a bit of a reckoning. There were um, legislation, there's legislation passed for banning Nazi things. And like, basically there was a way forward to move forward as a country altogether. We never really mm -hmm. had that. We had that little tiny mm -hmm. period of reconstruction, um, but it, was, it wasn't very it long, real. it wasn't long enough yeah. to basically, again, bridge that connection of realizing that black bodies are intrinsically valuable, regardless of you know, our value monetarily wise during slavery, so. And that's okay. interesting you should say that because my question would be, and I'm not gonna get on the soapbox, but if we can get it, if we can give everybody a uh, stimulus check, what's wrong with reparations? Now, exactly. I'm not, I'm not one of those people. My, my, if my son hears this; he's gonna have a fit because he can't believe I said that. But we have, we have, we have done a very poor job of making an excuse for not doing something. Very poor excuse. And there I cut that off. <laughs> I'm not well, telling. And and even as historic sites, we can make the connections for people. You know, people are taught history as a series of isolated names and dates and events. That's right. And they don't learn the connections. You know, there is a direct historical connection between the slave patrol and the police. And how That's is right. weak as a southern state along the Ohio River can how can we ignore that? Yeah. You know, and those that's that's the truth that we have to talk about. Those are those are um you know, telling, telling those stories and telling the truth is, is absolutely, and, and connecting the present to the past, that is absolutely um, where we, our, our job is, and um, where we can always do better. You know, it's, it's a never ending process for historic sites to just do better. And, and Teresa, um, the thanks for bringing up the police force and the connections, you know, um, anyone, any enslaved person off the plantation, if you don't have a pass, you, you, you're a runaway. So they, they, they created these uh, police forces to, to police that, yeah, just that. Just that. Um, when we, when we, when we uh, talk about the, uh, the wealth gap, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity for the enslavers and his ancestors to accumulate wealth Oh, yeah. Uh, mm. The fact that the way chattel slavery works, the way chattel slavery is defined, the fact that not only are you enslaved, but your children and your mm. children's children mm -hmm. are enslaved, so on and so yeah. forth. It takes generations to, to, to rebound from that. Oh, yeah. And I know, and, and I know Cassandra, you, you mentioned that R word that people are afraid of, you know, reparations. But um, you, 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 when we have to factor all that, uh, when, when we think about, well, well, why is the, you know, the, the income of African Americans disproportionate to, to, to whites? Well, it, it all goes back to these sites. When, when we go, when we visit, you know, when we visit Monticello and, and, and we talk about Jefferson, well, we need to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, they see said all men are created equal, but, but, but three-fifths is a fraction. You know, that's not, that's not equal. And, and when that's we, bad math. But when, when we vi when we visit uh, uh, Montpelier, the home of, of James Madison, the father of our Constitution, yeah, yeah, we the people, you know, it should be we the people, comma in this room, because if you weren't in that room, it meant nothing to you. That mm -hmm. that same Constitution had to be amended many times to mm -hmm. include me. And as I look at the, you know, my African American sisters had to be 
uh, many, many times over more to, to, to include you. So we need to talk about these things. That's how these sites can, you know, can help Be you know, mm -hmm. connect the dots. That's how we can relate, you know, what happened then to, to, to what's going on right now. The fact that in, you know, 1789 in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at our constitutional convention, we had the opportunity right there to snuff out uh, the importation of enslaved people, yet they prolonged it for, for 20 more years. Mm. Um, and, and, and we're still dealing with the residuals. That's right. Of all that. That's right. Um, um, Bridget, right. oh, go ahead, Cassandra. Well, I was going to jump on, back, piggyback on uh, what the gentleman just said about, uh, you know, we, we're running around the country changing the names of things. Uh, my alma mater, where I came, I graduated from Thomas Jefferson in 1973. And I just heard the other day that they gonna change the name of that school. Well, don't change the name of the school. Just pay us what we need. Pay us to, for, uh, for our, for, for our, um, again, my son's gonna have a fit. Uh, just, just do the right thing. Don't run around the country changing names of schools. The, pe the people grow up, they graduate from that school, they're proud of that school, and you're going to change the name of school. What's that going to do for us? What's that going to do for my children, my children's children's children? It ain't going to do a thing for them, except forget where their grandmama went to high school. It's not going to do one thing for them. Yeah. And we, we do a lot of stupid stuff to, to so-called rectify something. That is not helping one thing. Pay no. somebody some money. I, I, would, I would agree with that, but I think we are also um, writing a dangerous line because if somebody can write a check and be off the hook, then they don't have to do the work. And I think there's a lot of work that has to be done. Um, and so I think financial reparations are only a small part yes, of what needs true. to happen. That's true, and but uh, don't I, I, don't, don't, I don't want people. I don't want people to think that they can just write a check and make their and make this go away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, but it it, it yeah. does start. Yeah, it is. absolutely. No, I concur. But yeah, and I don't think that's what Cassandra was saying. That that's just like yeah, yeah. just give us a piece of a pie. Even yeah, the playing yeah, field, even the playing field, because yeah, when you yeah. think about when Abraham Lincoln signed that bill to do away with slavery, he also put in there a little clause to give the masters reparations for losing their property for freeing their slaves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. where was our reparations in that? Because I think about my great great grandmother being set free quote on quote set free with what right um, what, sal so, what so, salary did she earn so while she so, worked all those years at oxmoor farm nursing 10 children that wasn't her own what what rep what how was she supposed to start all over well just he know that two, they <laughs> he gave her two acres of land to live on on Oxmoor Farm, bless his soul. He gave her a stipend for the rest of her life. But then what? Her daughter still had to come back. Tina still had to come back and take care of her mother who was still working on another, what, what was it called? Shirley Ridgeway that's still standing there that we went and visited. She lived there in a the house on that property still serving as a servant till she was 70 some serious years old. So how was she supposed to start over? Um, so, so there is um, Ridge there right corner. Examples, there are examples out there that uh, of of some people already doing some reparations. Yeah. Um, of sorts, you know, there's 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 Georgetown, Georgetown there's Georgetown University. Yeah. You know, they sold uh, two hundred plus enslaved people just to remain solvent. Uh, they sold them to Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so what they're doing now is they're offering uh, uh, discounted um, tuition to some of the descendants of those. But some mm -hmm. of the students, the current students, which took it a step further, and they said, well, you charged me a little extra uh, in, in, in my tuition and, 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 and we put it in this fund. So they're paying it um, and, and they're there are other organizations out there that are that that are paying it forward. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, a, especially in this uh, 
political climate, the fact that this is a an election season, so there, there there's more talk about you know reparations and 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 how 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 that could work. But I'm you know I'm all for the paying it forward. Uh, I'm not looking for a check, um, but something that can be established an endowment of sort mm -hmm. that 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 can that can help our future uh just place it'll take more generations to to, to close that 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 wealth sure. but i, I right. i'm for that yeah i had a uh, uh, dan had asked me that question in one of our interviews last year about like did i ever think about reparations i was like how could i not have ever thought about reparations but i feel that part of the reparations like Teresa said, it's only a part of it, you know, and this, this is true, but I think another part of it as far as on the financial thing, and I think that the United States government should take that burden to any and offer any Black person in this country that wants to search their ancestry and know where they came from, they need to, they need to fit, foot the bill for that. Because there's a lot of people, like even our own family, that doesn't want to know. They're fine right. with where they're at, where they're going. They could care less. They're like, well, we got over it. I had my education, sent my kids. To... That's fine. But you don't want to know where you came from? That's fine. That's an individual thing. And I'm not mad at them that they don't. Because it, like, like, uh, like Victoria said, it's a lot of pain. Yes. It, it's a lot of it's a lot of pain to bear, and that stuff has been passed down subconsciously through generation after generation. It's like, mm -hmm. why don't people save? Why don't people do this? And I said, because you know what? In the mindset, they, everything was taken from them. So they just hold on to it. And they any little mm -hmm. piece of money they get, they spend it. They spend it on what they want because they they, they have this psychological thing that fear that it's going to be taken away from them. They don't Trump. even know where, they don't even know where it's coming from. They don't even know why they feel this way. It, it, it is what it is, but I think the U.S. government, part of the reparations should be to pay for any black person in this country, any person. I'm not just going to say black. I'm saying any person that was displaced or taken and want to know where they came from, they should foot the bill. So, Bridget, um, when you were on the Reckoning Radio program, Shirley from Oxmoor um, quoted you in our chat saying that historic sites' greatest purpose is their potential for telling the truth. Um, and I, so that's just a great goal for us as historic sites to be able to tell the truth and also to find our own ways of, of reparations. Um, at Locust Grove, we have um, Interpreters of the Enslaved. It's a through a paid internship program with the University of Louisville. Um, and also one way historic sites, um, uh, Teresa touched on this earlier, is we've moved our language in different ways. We used to say slave, and now we say enslaved. We used to say owner, now we say enslavers. We used to say runaway slaves, and now we say freedom seekers. So ways of offering humanity back while these larger things can, can be happening. Um, but to kind of bring our conversation, this wide-ranging conversation, um, to its natural conclusion, sadly, as we're running out of time, um, but we're just, this is just the beginning. We're going to be continuing this conversation um, into perpetuity, and there will be another conversation like this one in April of 2021. But I wonder if I could ask, um, if I could give each panelist one to two minutes to answer this final question. Um, how do you, would you, as a descendant, like to see your ancestors recognized at historic sites, whether or not you are connected to one, um, like Bridget is connected to Oxmoor, Cassandra is connected to Farmington, or at historic sites um, in general. Um, and how can historic sites better facilitate involvement from descendants? So just some final thoughts on descendants engaging with historic sites um, that were places of enslavement. Um, I'll jump in there on that one because it's a that was that was a heart cry of my husband before he passed away, and um, one of the things he was he was a mayor of our city in Worthington Hills, um, and was going to run for the school board, um, but uh, shortly after he made that decision, he passed away, and he he. We got together with Kathy Nichols here at Farmington, and he talked to her about um, the prison 
uh, the preschool to prison pipeline and how he wanted to uh, use his tie here at Farmington to start a, a grant of sorts, uh, of uh, educational grant, where kids could come here and and learn how to um, find their families, look up people, basically in a nutshell. Uh, that was a that was a big deal with him. Uh, one of the things that Farmington has always done, as far as I'm concerned, since 2000, I believe it was 2003, or somewhere around that time when I got involved, um, I have always had a, uh, a like an open hand uh, here when I when I had questions or anything. The sites again can be um, really on the bandwagon and not just have a Band-Aid approach to um, the descendants of uh, the enslaved populations. A lot of people grin and say, yeah, we're going to interpret y'all. Yeah, we, we, we want y'all there. We want to know your stories. Well, do you really? And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not, that's not no shade on anybody because I don't know anything about anybody's place except here. And again, we've, we've had a, you know, I've had a good relationship here. I was out for a few years, but when I came back, they, it was as if I hadn't been gone. Um, and then the other thing is, um, what I would like to do for my husband's family, since he's no longer here, it's kind of my responsibility, especially for my children, um, that their contrib contributions, the contributions, I'll be specific, of David and Martha Spencer be a, a bigger part of the interpretation here. In other words, what did they do after slavery? What was done? Where did they go? How were they? And what that will do, that would include other people who know that they are descendants of these sites. They will be more forthcoming to know you know, what What did our people do? Where, where did they go from here? Fortunately, we kind of know. We know that David Spencer's son, Herbert, he was a construction, uh, he had a construction crew and he built homes in the Newburgh and Petersburg area. We know that he used hemp and hog hair to, to uh, build the buildings. Uh, where did he get that from? His dad, that's, uh, he, that's what he was known for. He was a blacksmith and he helped uh, construct things. Um, and so other people would love to have that information. We were at a funeral and they talked about uh, some of the slides that were, uh, were, were made. Some of the young people in the, in the, in the, um, that were part of the family said, daddy, ha mama connected to Farmington. They saw some of our pictures and they said, uh, these were other family members. They said, uh, we had no idea that we had, we went to Farmington on a field trip and they had no idea that they, well, you know what she said? Cause I didn't know. Cause I didn't know. And that's something that site individual sites. And, and I think all the ones that's represented here seem to be doing it, but they're, but they're, we can be a little bit better at that. Always. Uh, we, you know, we're, we're going to do books. I'm working on a book right now of people in that group that were old, um, old people that were in the Newburgh area that everybody talked about, but I didn't even know they're real. When I would hear my husband and his family, his family talking about these people, I didn't even know they were real till I started finding them on the census. Tell the story. When I ride by Petersburg Cemetery, I look over at the grave and my, my father-in-law's buried over there. I say, I'm going to tell y'all story. To the best of my ability, I'm going to tell y'all story. And that's what I've been doing for all this time. We never thought Glenn would be leaving and be part of the history, but we're going to tell the story. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Just passing on the knowledge of what you know, finding out as much as you possibly can. That's the only way to tell the story because we dang sure ain't going to get, not going to get it in the history books. <laughs> They're already trying to replace, they're already trying to, re they've already replaced, yeah. I think it was a story in Texas where they were trying to oh. take and take slavery out of the history books. I'm trying to call and them migrants. That, yeah, migrants. so they, they migrated over here. They volunteered. <laughs> Who volunteers to work for free? 
<laughs> for hundreds of hundreds of years. Now, granted, we know if any of us has done any type of history, we know that some of our some of the slaves were enslaved by the help of other Africans. We right. know this. Yeah, we, they like we, we know them. this. We know this. I, I read the, the story about the um, the. Oh, I'm not even gonna go on that because another that's another story. But it's we 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 know. We know, we know, we know, and we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep having a conversation. That's the only way the generations coming up behind us is ever going to know anything about it. And I, like you said, you're writing a book. I never thought about it, but you popped that in my head, and I'm like, wow, all the stuff that I've got, I'm going to get my cousins together, That's right. make photocopies of the pictures that they have, and so on and so forth, and try to put it together yes. myself. Because when I sit down with my four-year-old granddaughter in the next five, 10 years, and my grandson, who was seven months, and I talked to him, I want him, I want to be able to say, hey, yes. this is my mama, so you this are. is her mama, yes. this is her mama, and her mama, and her mama, and mama, mama. You know, now I'll be able to go back right now to, to Louisiana, but I want to go back even further. You yes. know, I, I found just, it's just a remarkable what I'm able to find um, online, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just grateful, and I, I, and I say this, with the with the knowledge that they were, they had my family enslaved. I thank God for the Bullet family for keeping the documents that they did. Oh yeah, and you've got so much more. You, you oh man, you, yeah, yeah. There's so much more there. Really, there I know. Is. I and know. Once you get started on that, once you get started, and Victoria, I I commend you for what you're doing. But you find out who your people. You you go back and look. Uh, we have a very good friend. I believe she's on the panel, Irma. I think is that her last name Bush? Yeah, okay. I see her name. She, she um she she years ago she asked me about uh her people. And uh, I think they're the Burl, Burls, I believe. And and whoever was helping her, uh, they were spelling it a different way. And then when I started looking, I thought, wait a minute now, it, it was a different spelling. And and uh here she was doing reenactments for Farmington. Doing a real good job of it. And she didn't even know who our people were. I mean, need to be, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was many years ago, and I, I hope I'm right because she's listening to me. I think we connected her to Booker T. Washington. Not Booker T. Washington. Who was it? It was a it was a man that wrote stories. That wrote. Uh, Washington oh, Irving. Huh? Washington Irving or? No, no, no. no. It was either Booker T. Washington or uh, his mother was here in Kentucky for a short period of time, and she hid in the in the when she was run away, she hid in the loft, the hay loft somewhere. I cannot believe I can't remember it. But anyway, my point is, everybody has a story. It's not just history. Uh, Mr. McGill talked about the wording. History, his story. Well, whose story are they telling? What color is that story? Yeah. Who's his? What his story is it? We've been listening to his story. Now, if you want to change the name of something, change that. <laughs> That's all we've been listening to all these years. That's all we've been going on, all these, his story. That's another soapbox. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's hey guys, okay. It's been... wonderful. It's wonderful to have um, Cassandra with your long um, years of working with Farmington and researching your family, uh, Bridget, who's just getting started, um, and then Victoria, who is um, educating the students of the future. Um, Victoria, do you have any final words or thoughts? Um, well, final words for me, I guess, to answer that question, um, I guess I would say. Um, is acknowledging those who worked on these sites, um, acknowledging their humanity. I think so many times, and it's not necessarily just the sites, but people in general, they want to just reduce it to, like you talked about, the change in verbiage instead of saying a slave. You know, it's easy to, oh, that happened to a slave. That's not, there's no connection to me. There's no humanity in that. Um, I think for me, it's, it's um, again, showing their humanity, their contributions to that site. Um, you know, and then also, again, I mean, it's, it's back to just telling the truth 
and telling exactly what happened. No, it's not gone with the wind with, you know, 500 enslaved people on site. It, it's, that's not Kentucky. That's not Kentucky slavery. Um, and then also making sure we let visitors know as well in these sites that even though you may think this automatically ties you in a, and just being honest, your whiteness ties you to this slave holding family, not really. Because when you look at the economics of it, most people could not have afforded, if you were in this time period, you couldn't, as a white person, you couldn't have afforded what the Speeds had, or um, you couldn't afford something that Riverside had. Um, it's being honest about this was a group of people, um, the, the, uh, the slaveholders that were there, um, who were upper class. These were richer people. Like, your history is not really tied to them in that regard. And I think once people, especially the majority, realizes that your history is not tied directly to them, your family didn't have that type of money, <laughs> uh, most likely, um, I think it helps to, um, to not put people automatically on the defensive. Like, I've got to protect, you know, these owners of this property because if we tell the truth that, yes, they raped some of their enslaved and, you know, they had children, from that or you know yes they you know whipped their enslaved people and we have images of that you know left over so it's telling the truth and realizing that people are not black and white um there are tons of shades of gray it's tons of tons of um different levels to things and just to me just not sugarcoating it tell it tell it exactly how it is um you know it wasn't necessarily always a house of horrors um but on the same token let's not make it nice and pretty um, and especially for students coming up, because like I said, they're, they're wanting to know those facts of, you know, how police are tied to, you know, slave patrols. They're wanting to know how we get to this point and why there's so, so much animosity um, from various, from different sides, um, from people. And I think it's just, that'll help us, to be honest with you, I think, acknowledge the problems that we're having so we can move past this and do the work and be able to come together as a country. Because until we can acknowledge what the problem is, I mean, we're just going to keep going round and round with this. Teresa, any thoughts? Um, absolutely. I would echo telling the truth is probably the biggest. There are some very real things. Um, things like internships, um, paid internships are absolutely um, access, making sure that our sites guarantee access um, to the information available. Um, making um, not only getting the descendant community and if we can't find direct descendants even the communities around our sites um, are can our descendant communities making sure not we're not only engaging them um, getting them involved in the interpretation inviting uh, making sure that we are um, creating a culture on our boards where descendants mm -hmm. can be part of our boards you know for some for some boards that may mean waiving the financial obligation for sitting on a board Board. Um, but there are real things that these sites can do um, just besides our, our obligation as professionals, which is to tell the truth. That really is the bare minimum for us. Um, that, that's really only the starting, the, only the starting place. Um, there, are, um, there are real steps that can be taken to ensure that um, descendants are engaged and active in our sites. So, Hannah, can I say one more thing? I promise one more. Absolutely. One more thing, one more thing, and then Joe is going to let us know his <laughs> okay, He's so quiet back there. Um, my daughter made a sign for a friend of ours, and in her front yard it says, in the end we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Can anybody tell me who said that? No. Martin Luther King. Mm. That's a that very good statement. guess. <laughs> I said that would have been my first guess. <laughs> someone, someone did know in the comments, in the chat. Oh, that's, that's someone did know there. But, but thank you for sharing that, Cassandra. And Joe, your final words to take us um, off until we meet again in April. Yeah. Um, one thing, um, descendants of, of these um, sites, descendants of those who were enslaved at these sites, one thing we have to do is we got to help these sites uh, tell the story. We gotta, we, we, we gotta assist them in looking at things differently. You know, they got primary sources. They got them. They, they'll, they'll say some will, some will say quickly. Well, we don't talk about them because we don't know about them. We don't have, we don't have any primary sources. Well, yes, you do. If you got a census document, if you yes. got a census document with names on it, 
you know, well, since it's, it's probably no name on it, but they enumerate them. <laughs> they give them a gender, a race, and an age. That's something. They paid taxes on these people. That's they right. acquired property. Some of these places went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And when they go bankrupt, there's a, there's a paper trail. That That's right. Some of these people wrote letters uh, about about the, and they'll slip something in there about the, about the enslaved. You know, I got sassed, or or we had to whip well, you know, whoever uh, mm -hmm. to to today. Something something of, of, of in that there. nature. Yeah. You know, when when these when 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 the when the ladies brought the wealth into the marriage, uh, as soon as she says she says I do, then it, that wealth shifts to that male. What he's going to do? He's going to do an inventory. Mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to see to, to see what property he has. So so we, we we've got to help these sites look at the information that they already have differently. And why that's why is that important? It's important because right now they're pushing this thing called patriotic education. Patriotic education cannot stand up under the force of primary sources that mm. can tell the real stories of these sites. So that's why we as descendants of these sites have to um, help these sites along. We need to let them know that it's okay to tell the stories of the people that, that, that they enslaved there because the audiences that they're, they're, they're uh, educating now uh, mm. uh, is getting younger and mm. more receptive to the truth. Not that sugar-coated, watered-down, gone with the wind, hoop skirt, mint julep stuff that they've been <laughs> um, telling all along. It's 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 time to get on board and 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 do the right thing by the ancestors. Thank you, all of you, for joining us this evening. These are important conversations to have. Um, they're important conversations to have, especially. Um, now as we are at a turning point um, in both the relevance of historic sites and a, a reckoning to use um, Dan Gediman's language in the language of this evening. Um, we are incredibly grateful to Cassandra, Victoria, Bridget, Teresa, and Joe for joining us this evening. Um, we're grateful to our sponsors, Kentucky Humanities, Montgomery Realty, and um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation for sponsoring this evening. We're grateful to all 78 of you who joined us over the course of this evening and all 98 of you who registered for this program. Thank you. Um, because of your support, we're able to look forward to April 8th, 2021 for another virtual conversation. Um, you're making these conversations possible. Um, we're uh, on behalf of Farmington Historic Plantation, Historic Locust Grove, Oxmoor Farm Foundation and Riverside, the Farnsley Mormon Landing. Thank you. Um, we'll say goodbye and leave it here for now. Um, you just received an email on how to stay connected to all of these sites. Um, and please do stay connected to us um, between now and April 8th and be looking at all the things that we're doing between now and then to bring these stories um, to the forefront. And I think Bridget has one more comment. Bridget? You're not able to share the, the photo? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Oh. I have them, I have them up. Hold on. Uh, okay. Bridget brought, um, sent me a story. Let me see. I didn't even think about ours. Um, I, I have to share one, Bridget. Um, share this, Louisa. This is the photo. Is this the one you want? <gasps> yeah. Okay. So, so this is the photo that we found that someone uh, donated to Filson. Uh, there in Louisville. Mm -hmm. So it's the black and white. It's the black and white picture. I actually came across a photo chemist. Um, she's out of London and she's a, she's a historical photo re, you know, like, um, restore, wild. restore. Oh my and God. so she's, so she does her history. She knows the, the clothing and, you know, of the age, the era yes. and stuff. So I sent her, um, digitally sent her this picture of Louisiana, of Louisiana. And because of the, the time, of 18, I think it was 1870-something, uh, 79 when this picture was taken, she was able to put the color to oh, it. Oh, that's so that wonderful. Is, so that is my great-great-great-grandmother, Louisiana Taylor, a.k.a. Mammy Touche, as oh. the children <laughs> called her. And that oh. baby that she is holding is five-month-old Helen Stite. Isn't she, that something? She's either Mildred's great granddaughter or great great granddaughter i'm i'm not sure i'm not uh it's one of the two but yeah mm -hmm. that's when she was living with uh, living on um uh where shirley said river 
Ridgeway's corner when she uh -huh. was living with them. Yep. That's wow. wonderful. Yeah. Primary oh, source. My. Primary source. Oh, what a treasure. So, so in, in the memory of Mammy Touche, is that how it was said? And Mammy Touche, yeah. <laughs> all the other descendants um, that we try to carry on their stories, uh, we will leave you this evening um, until not too long, just April, but there'll be <laughs> lots of conversations like this between now and then, and we hope you'll be a part of them. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>